Are you ready for this? I've been born ready for this. Alright, welcome to this episode of Texplanation Shorts. I'm excited. I finally got the great Steve McKenna to sit down in studio with me and talk about what's going what in the world is going on at SNS. Okay, so you guys just got back from IBC and you had like amazing, amazing news, not just on the release front, but I heard there was some kind of like award. Something. We did win another award. All right, tell me. We've about been the racking award. them up. We're sweeping these darn things. This is great. So I mean, to, if this was the Emmys, you guys would get the Golden Globe. That's I mean, right. This is good. <laughs> to uh, yeah, to tack on to the uh, best in show from NAB this year and last year, uh, Evo Cloud also won the IABM award uh, at IBC this year. And this was specifically for Evo in the cloud. Uh, yes, cloud storage and workflow. Uh, absolutely. So it was definitely a part of that. Uh, so was the NAB award. We actually won two last year uh, at NAB, including remote workflow. Um, and we've kind of continued to grow into that. And a lot of our releases actually have to go around that as well. Love it. So, I mean, you guys are on our bender right now in terms of releasing just phenomenal feature after feature. There was one specific at IBC that I thought was just brilliant. Talk to me about it. And we're probably, I'm hoping we're thinking about the same one right now. Like, Hold on, let me, yeah, uh, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's seamless. I think it's remote workflow. Yeah, is what we're is. getting into. There it is. Okay. And it's really making it seamless, right? Because that's what SNS has always done. I mean, for us, it's necessity is the mother of invention. You know, it's, it goes back to our origin story, which was the other really exciting thing for us at IBC was this represents 25 years 25. in business. This is our, uh, silver anniversary yeah, pearl i think gold? either way you get a plate right. yeah something yeah not the watch yet that's when uh, they kick you out <laughs> but uh so yeah after 25 years you know we, we started solving a problem in an audio facility and the last few years in the video space have granted us a lot of problems uh to solve so yeah we continue to streamline the remote workflow using building on our share browser asset management that we've put you know into production applications so resolve uh final cut premiere uh, after effects but what we did was we took the proxies from the database and what we used to use a a different app that we had developed at the beginning of the pandemic nomad and we automated the proxy download and attachment in whatever production application you're using so it becomes completely seamless really for the editor they just link to media whether that be in evo cloud uh some other cloud on prem somewhere over a vpn wherever that might be doesn't matter. The behavior is going to sync up for an offline workflow. So they're doing this in app though, right? So they're in yeah. Premiere, they hit the sync button, proxy. They show don't even up. hit the sync button. They literally just drag media into project, link to it like they were going to use it anywhere else. Everything else just happens in the background. Nice. So uh, full remote production on virtually any of the major editorial apps and voila. Yeah. And once it's done, the kind of the coolest part is it's not. It's not a trick, right? It's not reliant on any kind of consistent internet speed. One of the biggest questions we always would get about remote workflows, well, what's the minimum bandwidth I need to make right. this work? And for us now, it's, I don't care however long it takes to get that local proxy, well, but unplug the internet. Most of those remote workflows are based on cloud caching, right? You got some right. cloud service that you're paying monthly or even hourly for to cache this data for you to make it look like it's close. You've gone one step further and say, screw close, just put it local. Exactly. Well, and really to make it transparent, because a lot of when there's when there is a problem with some of the cloud caching, it's not readily apparent to the editor. Right. We have a problem. Now we have to call someone. We have to figure this out. And time's a ticking uh, until we get to air until that project's done. So with this, it, it's transparent. It's understandable as well. If there is an issue, we OK, we got to go get that proxy again. That's not the end of the world. But yeah. I know what happened and it allows me to be a lot more self-service. Well, and it's probably a lot cleaner and a lot more affordable long term rather than paying to, you know, rent space on two different servers, two yeah. different services. It's like, boom, we're done, right? Yeah. And well, on the other side of it, even from a real time editorial, that was one of the other big releases, Nick, with the Evo Cloud was uh, Evo Cloud you can connect to over the SNS VPN service uh, that we released a few years ago. And we really refined that. We've been really working on like kind of data shaping, IO mm -hmm. shaping over time and over the wide area network. But you can do real-time editorial out of the Evo Cloud without a cache. We're not caching yeah, anything. Uh, we're seeing speeds five times uh, faster than kind of a Evo VPN one or SNS VPN version one or standard VPN. So we're getting a lot closer to that line speed. And I'm seeing. I was just talking to somebody last week who now has 200 meg uh, internet at their house, up and down symmetric. So I was like, "Whoa! I didn't even know that was a thing." Seriously, where do I sign up? 
Uh, something in Southern California, man. Uh, and there's, I mean, I, I got gig fiber to the house. I'm not arguing that. That's brilliant. I'm happy with but, gig, but this yeah. was two gig. That's, <laughs> you that's know, I'm sorry, two gig. Yeah, yeah. 200 back. No, no, that's brilliant stuff. So, okay, so we got the, the cloud, you know, the basic cloud editorial has been solved by Evo. Yes. Right? I mean, and so now it's edit proxies and immediately the master file is updated or the project mm -hmm. file is updated. No more thinking about download, upload, push, pull. None of that mm -hmm. is sort of taken out. So you've got remote editors, slap them on an Evo and they're good to go. What else is exciting? I mean, I know you've got some larger chassis you're talking about now. You're talking about expanding beyond the typical framework of an Evo. Talk to me about where you're going with this. Uh, yeah, well, we've continued to really push on the idea of scale out, right? For a lot of our clients, they ask us for these giant spaces, whether that be again on prem or in a cloud or in a data center. So we've really enhanced a lot of the Evo cluster stuff that we released a few years ago. Uh, that's continuing to kind of flush out, so you can go many, many petabytes into a single namespace uh, at this point. But then we also kind of play on both sides, right? Because on the other end of this massive scale out thing that we're doing, we have the mod that came out, which is a box that I travel with. It fits in my backpack and it's everything that Evo is and it's everything that the Evo software suite is. So I have- But this in a small, easy to carry- Seven pounds. Yeah. 30 terabytes, seven pounds, dual port 10 gig. But most important, it ties into the rest of the Evo ecosystem in the Evo suite. So the mod, the little guy is capable of transcoding. It's capable of hosting a database for the asset management for share browser. It's capable of generating its its own proxies for remote edit. So it can also be a cloud edge device, right? See, I love this because we so, we hear so much about edge devices in the IoT world, in sort of the video ingest world. It's like, hey, I'm transcoding at the edge or I'm indexing and creating facial recognition at the edge. But we don't think about editorial at the edge, right? And that's sort of what you guys are solving for in this space. Yeah, well, and making sure that logging can occur wherever anything needs it. Like I'm on set, I can log that. Now the metadata transfers back. And as a post guy, this is something I've always liked the idea of. Let's get production to log uh, on that side. <laughs> Can you guys log but, that at Ingest, please? I mean, you're already there. Yeah. But it doesn't matter where the logging happens is what's really important uh, now. It's a, wherever you may be, you've got an Evo somewhere. And the other thing we've really solved for is the idea of an idle device, right? Is it normally, I mean, if we think about a production workflow, I go out, I shoot, I shoot onto the drive, I come back, I ingest the drive to the server. The drive now sits and it waits till the next shoot. Well, if that drive is a mod, we release the transcode accelerator. So now every Evo, every processor inside any Evo chassis, mod, 16 bay, nearline cluster, 100 nodes of nearline cluster, scales capacity, it scales speed, but we also scale compute. So when that mod is sitting idle, not on set, not traveling with anyone. Well, it's making your transcodes for your library faster. Um, it's making transcodes into share browser for deliverables faster through Slingshot. So it's really about, as it's always been, getting more out of the network and getting more out of the equipment that you have. So that's really what we've been focusing on. And I think that message has just really expanded at yeah. IBC this year. It's a workflow tool, yeah. you know, at the edge. So, okay, so I want to hone in on something. And we, we talked about this uh, a while ago, and this is value. So many storage vendors play the, hey, we'll see you in three years game, right? They want to recycle that storage. It's end of life. It's out of warranty. The drives are old. It's time to re replace the entire chassis. You guys have this really interesting story right now about value and long-term value. Now, we, can't, we probably can't name names, but you got a customer that has had storage from you all for eight years? Eight, nine. I have customers that have had storage from us for 17 years. Uh, there are 17 year old, but the original chassis, the original chassis, the original drives. Um, and we still support them. That's what you're hitting on is <laughs> what you're touching on. There is really fascinating because that, that model that you mentioned for a lot of storage companies, That's what keeps them afloat. Years, yeah. look, it's not what, it's not just what keeps them afloat. That's the model. That's the pricing calculation used to justify the expense of an all cloud workflow as well. Mm -hmm. You have to buy new hardware every three years. And if we look last year, uh, a couple of the major uh, cloud providers out there, the big guys, extended the usable life of the hardware in their data centers. So they capture the amortization over a longer period of time as well. Well, the only thing that's saying a private user can't do that is the manufacturer of that right. storage. Uh, and we're not- And the sales guy behind it who wants to get paid well, again, sure. right? Yeah, yeah, sure. 
well, and we're not going to do that. So we don't, within the, the confines of a general technology cycle, we do not um, hard end of life a product. We're never going to say, we just won't help you. It's too old. We won't get you support. We can't support you. There are certain things that age a 17 year old Evo. I can't get spare parts for anymore. Right. Fair enough. So we'd help. We don't coach unplug the cus- it client. Right. Yeah. We cut, we coach the customer through what our best practices if you're going to keep it going, but a customer should own something and they should be able to amortize it over as many years of useful life as it well, can. That's a massive amortization to say, you know, three years versus eight years. Yes. Right. Eight years of a life cycle on a piece of hardware like mm-hmm. that. That's a very expensive purchase for most customers oh, yeah. and to say, well, look, I mean, you can't buy cloud storage and amortize it over eight years because they charge you every month. Right. right? So try amortizing that. It's like, what's my life cycle? The longer it gets, well, the, the amortization is, is, well, to be fair, Nick, the amortization is really easy. You divide by one. <laughs> it's, it's whatever it costs. Yeah. That's the amortization. That's the cost per whatever it is. And not to say, again, we're big on this hybrid. We released Evo cloud. So not to say you shouldn't have cloud where it makes sense, but I think a lot of clients are finding that for, very large scale data storage for video assets that the cost can be a challenge. Um, for some people, it makes sense. For others, it's bet good to have options. Well, well I, like I mean, if that. I look at as an alternative to cloud, an Evo Nearline or an Evo cluster, right? Mm-hmm. At that same scale, the price only goes down. Right. The more you put on it until it's full, the price is down or flat. Versus the other direction, if I go in the cloud, the more we put into it, the more the price goes up, right? Right. So that, you know, scaling that out over seven, eight years, Mm -hmm. that's a phenomenal cost savings long term. It is. Right. And that's not achievable in the cloud by any stretch of the measure. Certainly not at present. It kind of isn't really that business model. I mean, I think we'll see cloud change in the coming year or two. I mean, there are newer storage technologies that will create denser and denser storage. Mm -hmm. And there's always LTO in the cloud, right? Which some people might call cold storage, but it's really just somebody else's LTO library. That has a cost change to it, but that's a really great backup. That's a right. really great, re- great redundancy because to recall that file is time consuming, expensive. Um, you know, on that but side. As it, I, and I fully agree with you. But as we do that, the infrastructure cost, you're right, as the new storage technologies come out, but then we have the cost of implementing those into Migration. these data centers. Yeah. Uh, well, even for the cloud provider itself, to upgrade a data center is not an inexpensive uh, process. And I think one of the things I'm seeing, not just from customers, but I mean, primarily customers, but very large scale customers, ones you wouldn't expect to hear this from, is this shift, even in the economic climate over the last year or so, that has become, we're not as focused on hyper growth anymore. We're focused on profitability. Yeah. I need to get more out of what I've got. I have these assets. How can I make money again off them? Right. How can I repurpose them? How can I control my spend? Uh, you know, there there was the old CapEx versus OpEx. Well, now you bought something five years ago and it hasn't been end of life by its manufacturer and you paid for it. You're sitting pretty yeah. in the OpEx versus CapEx. If you shifted everything into more of an OpEx model as five years ago, you're paying the same thing you were. And the only way to cut that cost is going to be to either find an alternative solution or cut people, cut well, headcount. The, and the cost of pulling things out of the cloud is an unforeseen cost. Right, you, I mean, well, it's foreseen. It's overlooked. Yeah, it's overlooked. It's well documented. But I mean, but if you just make a pivot to come out of the cloud, there is a cost to that. There is right. That's got to be factored into what you're doing, and that's sort of the golden handcuffs they want to keep you up there with. Well, and I think that's one of the things where it's really important. Again, just like some of these are old adages, right? Like the three, two, one, you know, backup model that we all know for decades now. You know, three copies, two mediums, one offsite, that kind of thing. Well, the cloud has taken on that that offsite role yeah. you know it's taken on that disaster recovery and it's it's great for that not having to maintain a who took the hard drive did iron mountain do the pickup and iron mountain's actually great for it too so i'm not saying one's better than the other but in doing that we forgot about the two we forgot about the one on prem and that one is actually your leverage with your assets yeah if you do want to switch you don't have to get it back the delete con the delete command is cheaper than the restore command you got it that's exactly so so having that on-prem copy gives you that that sort of error check of you know i don't want to pay the restore fee from you guys just go ahead and delete it right yeah. and the technology is amazing i mean I, i'm not saying anything negative there but it it's really about giving enter, enterprises uh the flexibility to put costs where they are whether it's i'm transcoding on the edge whether 
I'm storing on the edge. I'm doing editorial. I'm hybridizing things. I'm going multi-cloud, well, hi- whatever. Hybrid's the, the answer, right? Because I think what we have is we have everybody that went all in on cloud because they were sort of forced to. Now it's like, well, guys, hybrid was always the better plan, right? And so it's, it's getting people back into the conversation about being hybrid again. Why not? Their employees are doing it. Why can't your storage? Right. So, you know. Or your infrastructure or workflow in general. Yeah. And that's the idea of what we've done with SNS Cloud as well, is to take a lot of that award-winning Evo suite, the share browser, the asset management, and put it into a private cloud instance. Because with our cloud too, we are, there is no ingress, no egress, no compute charges, single tenant. It's a highly secure architecture on that side. And you don't have to worry about, oh, it's running on something else or this or that. You know, it's a very... It's the same thing we've done for software for years. We're trying to be transparent. Yeah. There isn't this hidden cost. There isn't, oh, that extra license is going to cost you more. Ooh, you oh, you got to buy. Cap. Right. Yeah. None of that. You know, it's just, here's what it is. It's predictable. Because that's one of the biggest things in M&E, I think, that we've heard is you can't budget a cloud workflow. And the way a business model works for production or post-production, if I'm a post shop, I don't get to go back to the studio for my overages. Yeah. Right? That's on me. So it's really hard for them. So this is something that's flat rate. You can budget it to a production. You can spin it up for six months. You can spin it down. You can do whatever you want. Love it. All right, what's next for uh, SNS? Uh, NAB New York. Nice. All right. Next week, it's actually. Well, it by is. the time they see this, it might not be next week. Who knows? Yeah, last week. Yeah. It was, um, uh, the show was great. Love seeing yeah, you Yeah, you too. It was, yeah. yeah, it was wonderful. Phenomenal. All right, Steve, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. This is Steve McKenna with SNS. Catch him at NAB New York. If you are watching this after NAB New York, sorry you missed him. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thanks for being on Explanation, the uh, short. Always version. a pleasure, Nick. Nice yeah. to see you again. <laughs>